In question number one, we have been given a set of uh, six statements and asked to identify which of these statements are wrong. As usual, the ideal way to solve a question like this is to identify the statements which are wrong and eliminate the answer choices which have the wrong statement. Now statement number two says teaching is like selling goods. This is a wrong statement so we can eliminate options two and four which have two in them. Coming down the list of statements, when we look at uh, statement six, it says that uh, there can be no teaching without infrastructural support. This again is a wrong statement because uh, you must have heard of uh, schools being run under trees. So infrastructure is ideal. It is uh, good to have uh, all the infrastructure that you need to run a good teaching session. but even without uh, the requisite infrastructure, teaching can happen. Therefore, six is a wrong statement. Now, when we eliminate answer choices which have six, then we can eliminate three. We have already eliminated two and four. Now, when we eliminate three, we are left with uh, choice one. So one is the correct answer. In question number two, we have been given four statements and asked to identify which one is the purpose underlying the use of a teaching aid. Now what are teaching aids? Teaching aids can be visual such as uh, charts or maps or graphs. They can be audio aids like uh, recorded audio songs or any audio content. They can be audio visual or uh, multimedia teaching aids such as uh, movies, documentaries which can be played in the course of a lesson. Now when we look at the answer choices Choice 1 to make the lessons interesting is a correct answer. Choice 2 to capture the student's attention is also a correct answer. To enhance access to technological resources is also partially correct. And the last choice to optimize learning outcomes is also a correct option. When you come across questions which have more than one possible correct answer, then you have to evaluate which one is the greatest or the most encompassing among all the four. Now option four to optimize learning outcomes includes the use of uh, teaching aids to make the lesson interesting. It also includes the need to capture the student's attention and it also means that we are using technological resources to enhance the learning or the teaching process. Therefore option four is the greatest among the four given choices. Therefore this is the correct answer. In question number three, we have been given two lists. List one has uh, teaching methods and list two has uh, the factors helpful in making them effective. And uh, we are expected to match these two lists. Now a typical process in solving uh, questions like this would be to identify and match the clearly correct items, which are the easiest matches among the two lists. And uh, then we can eliminate the answer choices, which do not have these obviously correct matches. When we look at list one, C, that is a discussion method, matches with uh, two in list two, which means that discussion method is essentially freedom to choose a theme and a scope for a frank exchange of ideas. So C should match with two. When we look at uh, the answer choices, only one and four have C matching to two. So we can eliminate two and three. When we look at uh, D in list one, that is personalized method. So personalized method uh, is where the teacher is having an interaction with uh, the student on a one is to one basis or it is a small group. So the teacher can give personalized attention to the students. So this is a way where trust and openness in a relationship actually builds. And uh, that is the most effective way to have a personalized teaching method. Therefore, D has to match with 1 in list 2. So when we look at uh, 1 and 4, which are the only options which are left after we eliminated 2 and 3, only option 1, D matches with I. Therefore, option 1 is the correct answer because uh, we have managed to match 2, that is uh, C and D, and the correct option is 1. 
For question number four, we have been given a set of uh, six statements pertaining to various evaluation systems and asked to identify which one of them are correct. When we look at uh, the given statements, statements three and five are actually wrong. The reason is the explanation that has been given for the evaluation systems has actually been switched or interchanged. Formative tests are those tests which are given during the lesson itself to understand whether the students are able to understand the teaching process and whether there has to be any change in the way the lesson is being imparted. Whereas summative tests are given after the lesson at the end of the teaching uh, process to evaluate the students against a given benchmark. This helps us understand what is the extent up to which the students have learnt in that particular teaching session. Therefore, the explanation that has been given here has been switched. So any choice or any answer which has 3 and 5 will be wrong. When we look at uh, the given options, 1, 3 and 4 can be eliminated and we are left with only 2. So 2 is the correct answer for this question. For question number 5, we have been given a set of uh, 6 teaching behaviors and asked to identify which one of them contribute to the effectiveness of teaching. Here, it would be easy if we can first identify the absolutely correct options and eliminate the answer choices which do not have the correct options. Looking at the list, number one, that is uh, lesson clarity, is absolutely essential because if the lesson itself is not clear, then the teaching will not be effective. The students will not be able to comprehend what is the objective of this entire teaching experience. Therefore, one has to be there in the correct answer. So we can eliminate choices two and four because it, they do not contain one. Going down the list of uh, teaching behaviors, we see that option five, that is instructional variety, is also absolutely essential because a teaching session where uh, the teacher is only going through the theory and just reading from the textbook is going to be extremely boring. The interest of the students will wane pretty quickly and the teaching will not be effective. So in an ideal teaching situation, the teacher will use not only the theory that has been given, but also include some examples from the real world, also include some practical and experiential component, maybe some multimedia components, audiovisual aids. So there has to be variety in the instructional process. Therefore, option 5 that is instructional variety is also effective in contributing to the teaching process. So since we have already eliminated 2 and 4 and we are left with 1 and 3, we have to see which one of these choices contains 5 as well. So only option 3 has both 1 and 5. So we can eliminate 1 and 3 will be the correct answer for this question. For question number six, we have been given a set of uh, five steps which are part of a typical research process and asked to put them in the correct order. When we look at uh, the five steps, then observation is always going to be the first step in any research process because it's only after you observe that you will identify what exactly is the problem situation. It's only after you identify then you will be able to develop a hypothesis or develop concepts and uh, develop some experiments to test those uh, hypotheses and uh, the rest of the process will follow. Therefore, in any situation, observation will be the first step. So any answer choice which does not have observation as the first step will be wrong. Therefore, we can eliminate 1, 3 and 4 and we will be left with 2 which is the correct answer here. Question number seven has a set of uh, six statements and we have been asked to identify which one of them correctly describe the meaning and characteristics of uh, research. There are two ways of answering this question. Either you identify those statements which are absolutely correct and choose that answer choice which has all the correct statements included in it or identify the wrong statements and eliminate those answer choices which have one of these wrong statements listed in them. We can first start off by evaluating the wrong statements. That is uh, the first one, which is uh, research is a method of improving our common sense 
is a wrong statement because improving our common sense is an offshoot or an outcome of the research process and not the meaning and characteristic of uh, research so any choice which contains one in it can be eliminated which means we can take out two and four going down the list of statements the third statement that is research is creativity and charisma is again a wrong statement because research might require a certain amount of creativity but charisma is not an essential part of the research process so we can eliminate 2 and 4 because they have the wrong choice that is 3 in them similarly statement 5 uh, which says a method of consulting and using experience is called research is again a wrong statement because this more aptly describes consulting as a process and not research so if a answer choice contains 5 uh, it can be eliminated therefore answer choice 3 and 4 can be eliminated so just by eliminating those answer choices which have the wrong statements we can take out 2 3 and 4 and we are left with 1 and uh, that would be the correct answer or the other way around we see that statements 2 4 and 6 are correct statements look at the last statement which says the answers provided by research can be empirically verified this is an absolutely correct statement and is absolutely essential for a research process or a, the outcome of a research because if i as a researcher have arrived at a particular outcome based on evaluating a certain data set then any other researcher should be able to replicate the outcome by looking at the same or similar data sets so this is where the research can be authenticated or validated by any other researcher therefore the statement 6 is a correct statement now moving up if we say research is the use of scientific method to provide answers to meaningful questions this again is a correct statement because the main objective of research is to identify some answers or come up with some solutions or come up with a hypothesis for a given problem on which there are some meaningful questions therefore statement 4 is a correct statement so now any answer choice has to have both 6 and 4 in it and that would only be choice 1 if you just want to be on the safer side and you want to evaluate all the statements you can also look at uh, statement number 2 which says deductive and inductive methods get integrated in the research process now as you know deductive and inductive methods are essential part of uh, most research process therefore uh, this is a correct statement therefore either by removing the options which have uh, wrong statements in them or by retaining only those options which have uh, only the correct options in either way we arrive at uh, statement uh, or the option 1 which is the correct answer for this question for question number 8 we have been given two lists list 1 contains research methods and list 2 contains the critical features of these research methods and we have been asked to match these two lists first start matching the simplest terms that is uh, those research methods which you are familiar with and then you can eliminate those answer choices which do not contain these correct matches so in list 1 the second item that is uh, b says case study method now case study method is the in depth study of a unit specified for the purpose it is the study of a given case or a specific case in depth therefore i can match b with 5 similarly philosophical method means it is the interpretation of the thoughts or the philosophy of a great thinker or a philosopher therefore i can match c with 2 now if we look at uh, the answer choices whichever has b matching with 5 and c matching with 2 will be the correct answer the only answer choice which meets both of these uh, requirements is choice 4 which is the correct answer for this question in question number 9 we have been told that a researcher uses a parametric test instead of uh, a non parametric test for analysis and interpretation of uh, results of a research now this situation can be described as a technical lapse in the handling of data and answer choice 3 would be the correct answer here and not any of the other options because the researcher is not trying to manipulate the research results and uh, not uh, involved in any malpractice or unethical practices therefore answer choice 3 would be correct now what happens if uh, the researcher uses the wrong test now any other researcher who is trying to validate this particular uh, results 
can use the correct test and arrive at uh, a conclusion that uh, the original researcher had been wrong and uh, the outcome of the research is uh, wrong but as such there has been no malpractice or unethical behavior here it is just that the researcher probably did not understand the right type of test that has to be used and he used the wrong test so this is a technical lapse therefore answer choice 3 is the correct answer to understand more about parametric tests and non parametric tests you can pause the video here and read more about it in the table that has been given below question number 10 gives us a set of uh, four different activities and asks us which of these four activities gives the most amount of latitude to the researcher for creative expression now this question is similar to a question that we solved in series p paper which was held on 8th july 2018 when we look at uh, the potential for creativity and uh, critical thinking then as the size of the event increases it increases the number of interpersonal interactions increasing the latitude or the potential for uh, creative expression therefore among the given choices we see that there is a scope for creativity in all the four that is thesis writing also involves a certain amount of creativity writing research article and preparing research synopsis also involves some amount of creativity but the greatest latitude is provided by the biggest event so one two and four are essentially individual activities whereas three is an activity which happens in front of a big audience or a wider set of people which increases the number of interpersonal interactions for example when i present a paper in a conference then i will have a lot of questions that are uh, directed towards me i will have to defend my thesis and uh, explain my rationale to a wider set of people i will be exposed to different viewpoints and uh, different ways of looking at how my research is being presented therefore presenting a paper in a conference has the most amount of latitude for creative expression therefore answer choice 3 is the correct answer questions 11 to 15 are based on uh, your comprehension of a passage that has been given in the question paper now question 11 asks what was the world water forum most concerned with Right? So when we analyze the initial part of the passage, we can arrive at uh, two possible answers. One is that uh, the 40,000 people were talking about the power of water or that the theme of this uh, event was about sharing water. So the power of water or sharing water can be the correct answers. In the given options, there is only the power of water. So choice three will be the correct answer. Question number 12 asks us the deliberations on the theme sharing water would facilitate which of the given four options. Now before answering this question, let's reiterate that whenever you come across any such questions which are based on a passage, first read the questions and then read all the answer choices and then read the passage. In that way, you'll be able to minimize the amount of back and forth that you will have to do with the questions and the passage and you will also be able to focus on the most relevant aspects of the passage now coming to the question there is a particular statement in the passage which helps us answer this the statement is periodic assessment of uh, sustainable development goals of agenda 2030 now in the given choices there is a regular evaluation of uh, sustainable development goals so periodic assessment is nothing but regular evaluation so choice one is the correct answer question number 13 asks us to complete the statement that has been given in the question that is the institutional framework for brazil for water management what comes after that is it one two three or four when we read the passage we come across a particular sentence which goes like brazil has established a solid institutional and legal framework for water management based on the principle of multi-stakeholder participation therefore multi-stakeholder participation is the correct answer here now the complete sentence in the question should read the institutional framework for brazil for water management provides for multi-stakeholder participation therefore select answer choice two for this question question number 14 asks us what would be a high priority for both uh, new delhi and uh, brasilia as regards to river water 
when we read the passage there is a particular uh, sentence which says adequate treatment of industrial water the fight against contamination of river beds and assistance to drought affected areas are high priority topics for both new delhi and brasilia therefore the correct answer for this question would be choice 4 Question number 15 asks us uh, what is the main focus of the passage that has been given there will not be any straightforward answer to this uh, question like what we had for the other questions based on the same passage to answer this question you will have to read the entire passage and understand the context and understand the purpose with which this passage was written also looking at uh, the answer choices that have been given resolution of water conflicts encouraging bilateral cooperation and river interlinking will be a subset of management of water as a valuable resource so the entire focus or the entire concept behind this passage is about the management of water as a valuable resource therefore the correct answer will be 3 which is management of water as a valuable resource for question number 16 we have been given an assertion and a reason and asked to identify the correct answer from among the four given choices this is uh, somewhat of a tricky question so let's uh, start off by evaluating reason r because that is the simplest statement among the two meanings are learned as a result of one's prior experiences this is uh, a true statement because if you look at a gesture like uh, nodding our head so we all know that nodding our head indicates saying yes and when we see somebody nodding uh, their head we automatically know or assume that uh, that person is saying yes now nodding our head is something that we learnt as a result of our past experiences sometime in our childhood so even a small child would know that nodding his or her head is uh, supposed to indicate saying yes so reason r is true now among the four answer choices the statement which is correct should have reason r is true so 1 and 2 are the probable correct answers now we will have to choose the best among both now look at uh, the statement uh, uh, in the assertion field which is meanings of messages used in classroom are arbitrary in nature this is also true because depending on the context and depending on the situation and depending on the people the meaning of messages or gestures might change and become arbitrary therefore assertion a is also true now since we know that reason r is true and assertion a is also true then the only answer choice that has to be correct is option 1 so one is the correct answer for this question question number 17 has uh, an assertion and a reason we have to identify the correct option from the four given choices let's look at uh, reason r it says beliefs habits customs and languages are the cultural characteristics of uh, communication this is uh, a true statement in india the 2001 census uh, says that there are 1576 different mother tongues which includes the various dialects of uh, the different languages that are spoken in india and uh, there are 22 major languages so depending on the region of the country you are from depending on uh, the specific community you are from your language will change and uh, the characteristics of communications will also change and your customs your habits and your beliefs will also change depending on which community you belong to therefore reason r would be a correct statement similarly it says classroom communication has a cultural dimension this is also a true statement because uh, depending on maybe the majority community within a particular classroom the cultural dimension will be a reflection of the majority or in some cases like uh, there are specialized institutes where uh, a select to group of students uh, are studying for a particular subject then there is a culture that develops within the classroom and uh, that is the norm that is followed by everybody so depending on the set of people who are part of the student body the cultural dimension also changes and the classroom communication will also change along with it therefore reason r is correct and assertion a is also correct and reason r is the correct explanation for a therefore code 1 is the correct answer question number 18 asks us 
In a classroom, teachers and students use self-interest issues to judge which of the four given choices. First, we'll have to understand what self-interest is all about. Now, self-interest refers to actions that elicit the most personal benefit. Like Adam Smith explained, it is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own interest. Which means that when we look at a shopkeeper who is selling some goods from his shop, he is not doing it to pursue any social cause. He is selling it just because he wants to earn a profit and increase his own wealth. So he is trying to protect his own self-interest. Similarly, even if it is a benevolent cause like uh, donating to a charity, it is not being done because the person is pursuing a social cause. It will be primarily done because the act of giving to charity gives some kind of a good feeling or uh, some kind of a emotional well-being for the person who is doing the donation. So, behind every act, there is a self-interest. Whether it is positive or whether it is negative, there is a self-interest. Similarly, in a classroom, we can see that self-interest is a good predictor of social behavior. For example, there might be a person who is very rude in true life. However, in a social setting, especially in a classroom, he might behave in a very polished and a very sociable manner and a very affable manner because he or she knows that the behavior in the classroom will affect how he is perceived by others and how he is accepted by others and it results in a benefit for the person whether the teacher or the students, their behavior will benefit themselves in the classroom. Therefore, teachers and students use self-interest to judge their and others' acceptability as well. Therefore, answer choice 1 is the correct answer here. Question number 19 gives us an option of uh, 6 different variables and asks us which of these variables affect the information processing in a classroom. Now this question can be answered by identifying the variables which do not affect the information processing and eliminating the answer choices which have those variables. For example, looking at uh, number 5 which is market expectation. Now we are talking about information processing that is happening in a classroom between the teacher and the students and between the students themselves. Therefore. Market expectation does not have a correlation with the information processing in this setting. Therefore, we can eliminate the answer choices which have 5 in it. So we can take out 1, 2 and 3 and with this step alone, we can arrive at the correct answer 4. To be on the safer side, we can consider variable 6 as well, which is institutional intervention. Now institutional intervention happens either before the classroom session has started or after the classroom session has ended but does not happen during the classroom session. Therefore, institutional intervention can also be eliminated from the list of variables. And considering that 5 and 6 are wrong, we can eliminate any answer choice which has either or both of them. So we remove 1, 2 and 3 from contention and we arrive at the correct answer which is 4. In question number 20, we have been given an assertion and a reason and asked to identify whether these statements are true and whether they support each other. Now these statements are about a concept called selective exposure. Therefore, let's first understand what selective exposure is all about. Now selective exposure is a theory within mass communication that basically says that uh, people will expose themselves to information that aligns with their beliefs or values and will tend to avoid contradictory information. A simple example would be that before I go into a particular classroom, if uh, my seniors or if uh, my friends have told me that uh, this lecturer is bad, he does not teach well, he passes on wrong information and if he's uh, been labeled as boring, then I'm going into the classroom with a preconceived notion, with a belief that I will not learn much from this particular lecturer. Therefore, my ability to understand what the lecturer is uh, saying, my openness to receiving the communication from the lecturer will be less. Therefore, I will carry a set of beliefs and values and uh, 
a set of information that I have received prior to the classroom session and that will affect my behavior or my assimilation of the knowledge that is being uh, passed on in the classroom. Therefore, assertion A that is uh, selective exposure in the classroom is dependent upon uh, the student's perception or knowledge about the source of information is absolutely true. Similarly, when we look at reason R, it says the effectiveness of communication source determines the selective exposure of students to information. Now, before going into the classroom, even if I do not have any preconceived notion about uh, how the lecturer is going to teach, but after sitting in the classroom for maybe 15 or 20 minutes, I realize that he is very boring. He is droning on about something which is going over my head. Therefore, the effectiveness of communication is very low. And even during that same session and in the subsequent sessions, I will develop a belief that this lecturer will not be able to teach much. I will not be able to understand what this person is teaching. Therefore, my openness to receiving information from this person will be less. Therefore, the reason R is also true. Since both A and R are true and R is the correct explanation for the assertion A. We can shortlist one as the correct answer and mark it. Question number 21 gives us a series of numbers and asks us which is the number that should come at the end of the series. We solved a similar question in series P paper which was held on the 8th of July 2018 and the process for solving this question is also exactly the same. So start off by using the rough sheet at the end of the question paper to write the numbers next to each other and uh, find out the difference between each number and the subsequent number. We see that the difference between 5 and 11 is 6. The difference between uh, 21 and 11 is 10 and 35 to 21 is 14 and the next number is 18. Therefore, the progression of the difference between these numbers is increasing by 4. 6, 10, 14, 18. So the next number that has to come in this series is 22. Therefore, if you add 22 to 53, we arrive at 75. Therefore, choice 1 is the correct answer. Question number 22 has given us uh, a set of alphabets and asked us to identify which is the set of alphabets that comes at the end of this uh, series. Now, the first step that we can do is to see if we can eliminate any of the answer choices. Since XY has two alphabets and ABC has three and FGHI has four, the next term obviously should have five alphabets. But this does not help us in eliminating any of the answer choices because all of them have five alphabets. So let's, st let's write down these sets in uh, the rough sheet that has been provided and we see that these are actually in a logical progression that is uh, x, y are adjacent to each other and a, b, c are adjacent to each other then f, g, h, i are adjacent to each other. So any term that comes at the end of the sequence also has to be in the same sequence in the sense it has to be adjacent alphabets. So using this option alone if we look at the four given choices 1, 2 and 3 and 4 we see that only two has a logical progression where M, N, O, P, Q are the way the alphabet should be written whereas all the other three choices the letters have been misaligned. Therefore with one step alone we can eliminate the other three choices and identify two as the correct answer. If you want to validate this you can also see what is the difference between each set of alphabets that is after X and Y there has to be Z and the alphabet repeat themselves and then it goes to ABC. Between ABC and the subsequent set that is F, G, H, I there have to be D and E which is two alphabets. Therefore after F, G, H, I there has to be three alphabets and the series that comes after that should follow. Therefore the three alphabets will be J, K, L and that is followed by M, N, O, P, Q. Therefore choice two is correct. So either by looking at the way the alphabets have been written we can eliminate the three wrong choices and arrive at the correct answer or we can use a little bit of mathematics to identify the difference between each of these sets and then also we will arrive at the answer choice 2. So 2 is the correct answer. 
in question number 23 we have been uh, told that uh, allahabad will get transformed into the set of alphabets that have been given after that using a particular code and we have to apply the same code for the word bengaluru and uh, identify which of the given choices does it uh, transform into now when we write down allahabad in a vertical manner and uh, see if there is any similarity in the way the same alphabets have been treated in this particular word we see that uh, all the a's do not have a particular uh, sequence in the sense all the a's do not become d right and all the l's do not become p so we can eliminate that possibility now we look at uh, what is the difference between uh, the individual alphabets and uh, the corresponding alphabet in the code we see that uh, there is a logical progression that is 2 3 4 5 6 so all the way up to 10 so which means that if the same code is applied to the word bengaluru then b becomes e e becomes i and n becomes s so the first three alphabets of uh, the new code have to be e i s and the answer choice 3 is the only one which has this uh, set of letters therefore we can shortlist 3 and move on we don't need to do the rest of the alphabets we don't need to uh, do the rest of the process because we have already arrived at the correct answer and we can minimize the amount of time that we need to spend on this question so identify 3 mark it and move on to the next question question number 24 says that uh, a man paid 160 rupees for traveling 10 kilometers in a taxi and there was some initial fixed charge also for this particular journey and uh, another man paid uh, 276 for traveling 16 kilometers and the driver charged the second man twice the initial fixed charge and we have been asked to identify what is the charge per kilometer now this can be solved by converting the statements into equations and uh, let x be the initial fixed charge and uh, let y be the rate per kilometer so the first part of the statement gets transformed into x plus 10y is equal to 160 that is x was the fixed rate that had to be paid and the person traveled 10 kilometers at the rate of y so the total amount came to 160 for the second person the driver charged 2x that is twice the initial charges and uh, the person traveled 16 kilometers at the rate of uh, y rupees per kilometer and the total charges came to 276 now multiply the first equation with 2 and uh, everything gets doubled so we get 2x plus 20y is equal to 320 so now we have 2x in both of the equations so subtract the second equation from the first equation and we will end up with 4y is equal to 44 therefore y is equal to 11 so y as we had uh, predetermined would be the charge per kilometer therefore y is 11 so mark answer 3 and that would be the right answer question number 25 is uh, more of a geometry related question which can be solved more effectively by writing down the given statements in the form of a diagram so it says gopal walked 20 meters towards the north and then he turns right and walks uh, 30 meters and then he turns right again and walks uh, 35 meters and then he turns left and walks 15 meters and finally he turns left and walks another 15 meters so if you look at uh, the blue lines in the given diagram that is the entire journey or the entire walking that uh, gopal has done so we can see that uh, at the end of this entire uh, walking process uh, gopal has ended up at a point which is uh, parallel to the initial point now we have been asked to identify the shortest distance between the original position and the final one now the shortest distance between any two points is always a straight line therefore just draw a straight line from the initial starting point and the ending point and we see that it is essentially a distance of 30 meters plus 15 meters therefore the correct answer choice here would be 4 which is 45 meters <laughs>